Live from the JSA Podcast Studio, presenting Data Movers, showcasing the leaders behind the headlines in the telecom and data center infrastructure industry. Welcome, everybody, to our podcast series, Data Movers. I'm your host, Jamie Scott Okutaya, founder and CEO of JSA, along with my fabulous co host, top B2B social media influencer, Mr. Evan Kirstel. Evan. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Data Movers, where we sit down with the most influential men and women in today's data center and telco world, supporting the network infrastructure requirements of this new normal. Jamie, good to see you again. Awesome to see you. And it is a spectacular day here at JSA. We have so much celebration going on. So uh, after this podcast, I'm, I'll have a glass of champagne in my hand. Um, JSA uh, is uh, now able, today's the 17th, so we're able to announce that we made two amazing lists. Uh, one top 100 elite PR agencies uh, in the country. Uh, by PR News, and the second is uh, the in, the very famous Inc. 5000 list. So uh, really exciting, big news. Um, and so huge kudos to our team, to our clients, our community uh, for, for this uh, amazing uh, benchmark here. Um, Those are huge milestones. So, so tell us, looking back, when did you start or found JSA? How many years have you been uh, running the company? 16 and a half years ago. So 16 and a half years. So it's it's just a fast race to the top, right? I, <laughs> that must have just flown by. Obviously, you started the company when you were 16. So uh, so there you go. Yes, thank you. I learned a lot since 16. <laughs> well, fantastic. And I think you have another one of your fantastic clients and guests on today as well. Yeah, and I'll tell you, it's, it's because of clients like... Uh, like Mr. Jim Marazzi, CEO and president of DQE Communications, who uh, support us and, and uh, um, allow allow for this growth. So let's let's get right to it. Um, Jim, welcome to Data Movers. Thank you. Let yeah, me... welcome, welcome, Jim. Great to uh, to meet you. I was actually just reading your bio uh, just before uh, the podcast here. And you know, starting from the beginning, you actually went to a great Philadelphia institution for school, Drexel University. You got an MBA and a degree in electric, electrical engineering from Drexel, which is uh, phenomenal. So tell us, do you do you still debug circuits in your spare time? <laughs> I wish. You know, I wish I still had those technical chops uh, in me to be able to do that. Um, <laughs> And I always did enjoy the engineering aspect of things. And, uh, you know, it was great training coming through at Drexel University. And maybe something that folks don't know about that is it's a five-year university. So you do a co-op program there and you are working six months in industry and six months in the classroom. So that's why it's a five-year program. And I got just great, great training and can, kind of confirmed for me that engineering is really what I like to do. And so it was a, a great choice and it was a great way to sort of come out of school with um, knowledge of what you were gonna be doing. Well, I'll take your word on that. I could barely stand three years at university, but let's fa fast forward to now and tell us more about yourself and DQE Communications and the businesses you serve, uh, sort of a, an interesting combination of Southwestern Pennsylvania, Eastern Ohio, Northern West Virginia, kind of what, what brought you to those markets? Sure, happy to do so. Before I do that, let me just congratulate Jamie as well. That's awesome. Good news for you and uh, uh, all, all great stuff. So congrats. Thank you. Uh, hey, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, certainly, we're excited about uh, being able to partake in this and uh, you know, also excited about what we do and how we serve our customers. So DQE Communications is a fiber optic data provider in southwestern Pennsylvania primarily. Uh, Pittsburgh is our home. That's where we have our roots. That's where we've been doing business for many, many years, and they're the customers that we serve. Um, we serve the southwestern PA region, uh, northern West Virginia, eastern Ohio, and recently moved into uh, the center of the state, uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, as well. So what we do is we build big fat data pipes for our customers and we do that with fiber optics and we connect all of these enterprises, whether they're business enterprises or governmental institutions, schools and school districts so that they can have the connectivity and the data access that they need. 
it's been a really fulfilling and rewarding kind of a mission that we have. Got great, great people at DQE Communications. Uh, they know the importance of serving the customer. They know the importance of keeping the, the circuits lit, if you will, you know, the terminology that we use and how critical what we do is for their mission critical business. Whether you're talking about a hospital or a university, they need these services. And you know, our team kind of looks at that and says that that's, that's kind of job number one. And we're really proud of that. And I take it you're not a Pittsburgh uh, Steelers fan at all. Well, I certainly am a Pittsburgh Steelers oh. fan. Uh, I, bet. You know, I, I consider myself kind of a, a, a pan Pennsylvania fan here because, you know, I spent time in the eastern part of the state in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. So, uh, you know, when I first joined the, the DQE family, people gave me a little bit of a hard time because I came from the Philadelphia region with the Eagles and the Steelers, but I say that we're all Pennsylvanians and you can root for more than one team. <laughs> so uh, I've tried to bring that to DQE as I've gotten there as well. Uh, um, and, you know, talking about that, um, that expansion uh, in the past couple of years uh, from the Pittsburgh metro area into the state capital, Harrisburg here, mm -hmm. what's it like to oversee a company's entry into a new market? And, and what is it like being you know, the new competition on the block? Well, you know, it, it's exciting, first of all, to, to do something new, to build, to grow, to figure out, you know, what to do next. So that's always the, the fun aspect of the job is to kind of thinking down the road a little bit. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's work. It certainly is a lot of work. Um, as I said, what we do is we build fiber optic networks. So it's not something that happens overnight. There's a lot of engineering, a lot of planning that takes place a lot of interaction with local utility companies to gain access to poles and conduits and things of that nature. So there's truly an engineering and a construction aspect of it, first and foremost. But then there's also the business aspect. Why would we go there? What's the business opportunity? How can we be helpful to customers? What needs are not being met in a marketplace? So you try to you know, look at it from multiple perspectives here. And for us, you know, the philosophy that we've had is to try to follow our customers where they are. As I said, we do a tremendous amount of business in, uh, in the Pittsburgh Western PA region. And we have a, a number of customers that also have presence in Harrisburg, the state capital. So since we're serving their needs locally in Pittsburgh, it's a natural extension to try to serve their needs also in those markets uh, as well. And that's, that's how I would prefer to go about my growth in a very systematic kind of an approach there. Not always the case, not always uh, with the luxury of doing that, but when you have that kind of an opportunity, it makes a whole lot of sense. And, uh, you know, we've, we've enjoyed it. We've enjoyed kind of continuing to expand this network. Um, you know, we are one of the smaller players in, in the fiber optic space. You know, you clearly have the large national players and things of that nature, but for a company of our size and where we focus our efforts, we build a solid, you know, network and a very deep, rich fiber network in Western PA, and now moving into the center of the state and also into uh, West Virginia, the northern part of West Virginia as well. Interesting. So, as a metropolitan fiber provider, you you face pretty stiff competition from the giant players in our space, uh, who are, of course, known for their amazing customer service. Uh, just kidding. Um, so how do you differentiate yourself and what advice do you give to business leaders who, who are facing competition from, you know, big tech or giants like, like the ones you compete against? Well, you know, I, mean, I think you hit the nail on the head there in terms of service, right? So uh, large doesn't always mean bad service, but large could indicate poor service. Uh, I, I we really do try to focus on knowing our customers and providing them unparalleled service. Um, being the local provider, having the relationships with the local municipalities and the schools and the school districts and things like that, I think it's critically important. And you've got to be able to deliver on the commitments that you're making here. You know, we live, work, and uh, kind of breathe in the community. So we want to be good partners to all of our customers. So we really do try to distinguish ourselves on that service aspect. And I know a lot of people say that, a lot of people sort of use that, uh, that phraseology, but we really do try to take that to heart. Service is really important. Um, you know, what we sell is something that could be provided by others, the very, very large national and international players. And price certainly does 
come into customers decision making processes, but they also give you credit for your reliability, your ease of doing business. And I think that's a really important concept for ease of doing business. Can they pick up the phone and get what they need? Can they get it in a timely fashion? Is there someone to answer their phone call when they have an issue or a question, as opposed to going through an inordinate phone tree to try to figure out, you know, well, who do I talk to if I have a, a problem or a concern? So that's something that we've really tried to uh, distinguish ourselves on is that service aspect. But one other thing I wanted to kind of uh, talk about with regard to how do I compete with these players, um, that's the competition side. But there's also an opportunity for me to serve them. And that's a fairly significant part of my business. So if you think about the kind of customers that I do really well with, it, they are locally based organizations, whether they are you know, headquartered in Pittsburgh or their local municipalities, uh, local school, school districts, they're Pittsburgh centric customers and I have the best opportunity to work with them. For those people, that are national kind of customers, maybe big box stores or retailers or things like that. I don't necessarily have the relationships with them. Maybe one of my big competitors do, and now they need to go fulfill in 50 cities or 75 cities. And they come to a DQE communications to locally fulfill on their national contract. So we've actually built a very nice business in uh, being that last mile provider to some of these national customers who do business with the national providers. So it's actually a, a nice win-win kind of a combination for us. I love it. Coopetition. That's what I call it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, and you, you mentioned those locally owned, uh, locally based uh, customers um, from the schools to financial companies, the healthcare organizations, commercial real estate developments. Business leaders are really trying to dig deep, invest in those digital transformation uh, processes right now. What's driving all this? Oh boy, I, I think there's a lot of things that are driving it. Certainly it's happening, it's happening at an accelerated rate. I think organizations, whether you are a for-profit organization or a local government, you're trying to make informed decisions and you're trying to make data-driven kinds of decisions. You're trying to optimize your operations and take efficiencies uh, or inefficiencies out of the equation. And that's all predicated on access to good data. It's all predicated on access to quick, reliable data and having you know, that, uh, that information absolutely when you need it. Um, so I, I think as organizations get more sophisticated, are more motivated to make informed data-driven decisions, their reliance on data analytics, artificial intelligence, all those kinds of things, just becomes almost like uh, a common way for them to conduct their operations. And to enable all that, they just need some of the, the, the plumbing that we supply. You know, they need that sort of that physical connectivity. Um, you know, years ago, what you saw for larger enterprise businesses, they would have in-house data centers. They would sort of be, own their own steel. They would sort of have their own space and air condition it. And then it moved to, well, you know, are there locally based third party data centers? And they kind of moved to that aspect. Well, now the vast majority of enterprises are going to cloud based services, you know, whether that be in Ashburn, Virginia or in Chicago or places like that. So they still need all of these very, very low latency, high reliability kinds of fiber optic services that we provide. Because what that does, it enables them to fulfill their mission much, much more uh, quickly. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's really great to see advanced technologies in the data center and optical world move into uh, new markets outside of the big tech centers and big cities in Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia. Actually, the state of West Virginia is a client of mine as helping them promote the state as a destination for startups and, and even remote workers. Um, you know, what's, what's inspiring you to grow into these markets and, 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 and lead your company into these, these new non-traditional tech, tech markets and finding customers there? Yeah, you know, so it's trying to follow the opportunity. Um, you mentioned West Virginia, you know, there's an area down off of I-79, the high tech part, or as they, they uh, promote themselves, um, and, and they're having some nice success. You know, they, they are saying, we are not the traditional area where you would see a lot of high tech kind of companies like a Silicon Valley or places like that. 
but there are smart people all over this country and you can locate them anywhere and be super productive and super creative and, and develop products and services. So we're seeing more of that throughout the US. And fortunately, we're in an area where people you know, are, are locating and tend to want to locate. So we're simply just trying to make sure we understand the landscape and to be responsive to that. And if we're smart enough, be just a little bit ahead of that so we know where to go with, with our builds and try to be helpful to people. You know, we're fortunate in that uh, the Pittsburgh region has uh, a couple of really great universities and uh, it really does develop new talent. And the new talent is more technologically oriented. One university that comes to mind, Carnegie Mellon University, extremely strong with robotics, computer programming, computer science. They spin off a lot of sort of new startups. And you know, what we've seen as a result of some of those kinds of things is that the driverless car industry really is kind of, you know, there's a nexus in Pittsburgh because of just that feedstock of smart individuals. So, you know, they're kind of examples of what we're seeing in terms of technological development, sort of the AI, robotics, driverless cars, those kinds of things, process automation as well. And then the other thing that we, we really see uh, in a very big fashion in P uh, Pittsburgh is um, just the, uh, the, the medical services companies. We've got some great uh, healthcare services in, in the Pittsburgh region. And they're at the forefront also of developing technology and, and uh, therapeutics and treatments as well. So um, it, it sort of breeds that, that mindset and it's great for an area and an economy to have that. Uh, so, you know, that begs this question. I'm not sure if you can answer it yet or not, but are you planning any future network expansions to new markets maybe? So th thank you for asking that. Well, the answer is yes. The short answer is yes, but I can't tell you where and when. <laughs> Fair <laughs> but, enough. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're constantly looking for how do we expand, how do we grow, and, and how do we sort of be relevant to customers. Um, and since I've been at DQE Communications, we've grown the network kind of about twofold. And again, I know we're one of the smaller sort of providers out there compared to the large national players. But, you know, we do try to focus on being helpful to customers and where there's real opportunities. And we are looking for those other expansions as well, where we believe we can be helpful and provide a service that others maybe are not, uh, not able to sort of fulfill. Um, as I said earlier in my comments, we try to find areas where we have an existing customer that has a, you know, another location in a different city, a different geography, where we can be helpful to them. You know, I, I use an expression where um, we want to be uh, bigger than what we are, but not as big as some of those other players. You know, some would say, you're, you know, you're small, but big, but big is small. I, you know, I'm trying to find that nice middle ground where we can still be a person that delivers top-notch service and not just get lost in processes and bureaucracies and things like that. Yes. <laughs> nice approach. Well, let's, let's shift gears, talk about business and leadership from your perspective. What makes a good CEO and president? What's your sort of philosophy on leadership besides just being a super nice guy, which you clearly are? <laughs> uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, that's, that's nice to hear. Um, sometimes my employees wouldn't say that. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that as a leader, you uh, you certainly have to have the best interest of the stakeholders at, at heart. And when I think of stakeholders, I really do think about all of the stakeholders. I think about our, our team members. Uh, I think about our customers. And I think about the owners of our business as well. And I think a good leader, particularly a good CEO, has to give uh, attention to each of those three major components. You know, you need to focus on each one and not uh, sort of give short attention to one versus another. All three are very, very important. You gotta have great employees and you have to have great employees who are doing their best and, and have the right kind of incentives and the right kind of rewards in order to do that. You gotta serve the customers well and that happens because of great employees and you need to have the capital access and the capital funding and, and you know, give a, a very good return to investors so that they continue to want to provide you with the capital necessary to expand. So I think that's kind of first and foremost, is just trying to find that right balance amongst all the stakeholders. What comes right under that, um, you know, it's, it's really making sure that you are very clear to the organization of what your mission is. We are here to support other people fulfill on their mission. You know, we are here so that the universities in our area 
can do what they do well, so that the hospitals can do what they do well, so that the data centers can. So you got to be very clear that we're a customer centric organization and we will you know, move whatever obstacles in the way in order to satisfy the customer, deliver the reliability, provide the ease of doing business. If there is an issue or a problem, you work on it, you get it done right away. Everybody has problems, everybody has a blip. It's how you respond to those blips that really defines your character and defines how you have that customer relationship. Because again, you know, we would all be foolish if we sat here thinking that, you know, you never have an issue, you never have a problem. Everybody does. It's how you respond to those issues, I think is important. And, and then the last thing I just want to sort of get across is I think it's it's important that you, uh, you sort of stay connected and stay grounded with, with your employees and your customers. Um, you need to understand what's going on. You need to communicate a lot. You need to be in front of people a lot. You need to listen. And that's something that I had to learn over my career. You know, I had to learn to listen more <laughs> and talk less because, you know, as you're sort of growing up through your career, you think, well, I've got the answer to that. I know what to do. I know how to do that. Um, and you might be right, but listening is a skill and it's a critical skill that I think good leaders have developed and honed over time. They know when to listen and stay silent. They know when to add perspective. They know when to call on others to join in and be part of the solution. And I got to tell you, I am still a work in progress. I am still somebody who is uh, trying to figure it out and get better at this and, and kind of hone these things in. But I think that's, a, that's an important thing. Um, I, I said earlier, you know, I'm an engineer by training. You know, engineers, we love to see how things work. We love to sort of peel back the, uh, the blankets and see how everything is built. My... <laughs> My issue from time to time is I drop down into the weeds. You know, I, I want to see how this is built or, or what's going on or what the root causes are. Uh, every once in a while, I got to remind myself to kind of come back up to the 10,000 foot view level and let my subject matter experts kind of work what they need to work and me just kind of asking the appropriate questions and making sure that people are, you know, kind of uh, staying on task or, or being responsive to the deliverables there. Yeah. That is so hard as a leader. Um, I, I, uh, I definitely hear that. Um, and, and another thing that really spoke to me was um, when you said, you know, it's, it, your, your grit kind of shows um, how you respond uh, to issues. And, and for sure, you know, leading a company through any type of change is hard enough. But when it comes to leading a company through a global pandemic, you know, the stakes are just at an all time high. Um, what are some of the lessons maybe that you learned as a CEO through this past year and a half? Yeah, so certainly law, I learned a lot of lessons. Um, you know, I think the most important one is the need to still stay connected with everyone, even in this virtual environment. Uh, we were really, really good in terms of making that transition from being physically in the office to working remotely, whether it's from our homes or from some other location. Um, and, you know, your technology solves that problem and, you know, your planning solves all those kinds of problems, but what it doesn't solve is just the, the connection this, and I know, I don't know if it's a word or not, but the connection this to your employees, you know, you can sort of have a zoom call or a team's call or something like that, but you, you got to go beyond that. And you've got to sort of still take the time and the effort to check in with people, make sure that folks are doing okay, give them folks an opportunity to just kind of talk and, you know, um, get out their emotions. We all bumped into one another getting a cup of coffee. We, we all sort of talked about the Steelers on Monday morning after the Sunday game when we were in the office together and that stopped and it stopped abruptly. But so how do you sort of replace some of those interactions that you're having? And I, I think it was really important for us to focus in on that and make sure that we still paid attention to it. The other thing that I learned is just the importance of pre-planning and to go through those exercises of risk mitigation and try to plan for the events that were just kind of whiteboard exercises. Yeah. And I can tell you that we, we didn't really sort of think that a global pandemic was something that was possible or plausible, but we did plan for a major event that took us out of our offices for a seven day period. We thought, what if a major hurricane or major storm event or some other event to shut down major parts of Pittsburgh and we could not get our employees into offices and we could not sort of do business as we had done business in the past. 
what technologies, tools, protocols, processes would we put in place to make that happen? So we were ready for a remote work environment. We were ready with all of the technology. Every one of our employees had laptops, you know, and they, they were taking us home each and every night. We, we practice everyone VPing and in, into the, you know, the networks all at the same time to make sure we had the bandwidth and the capabilities and capacity. So the, the effort and the, the time you put into those things paid off handsomely for us. Our transition was seamless. It really was seamless. Conversely, I could tell you, you know, I know I talked with a number of our customers. They were really scrambling to go get a thousand laptops for their employees who routinely worked in the office and worked from desktop terminals. And now they're working from their homes. And how do they connect? How do they do all those things? So just that pre-planning and going through that risk mitigation kind of mindset really is important. I, I think it really helped us quite a bit. Yeah, it's all about resilience, that's for sure. It is, it is. You know, we build resilience into our networks. We make sure we've got dual pass and we've got, you know, sort of closed rings and all that stuff and two end technology. But how do you how do you build resiliency into the processes? How do you build resiliency into these kind of things that a lot of people don't think about? Well, does everybody have internet access at home? Does everybody have a laptop they could take from the office so we can continue to do what we need to do? Yeah. And I think uh, we can bring this uh, to a little bit more of our personal flavor right now. Uh, right, Evan, we usually like to get a little bit more about uh, here, here from. Uh, oh, yeah, that'd be, that'd be fun. So, so tell us around uh, Pittsburgh, what do you do in your spare time when you're not leading and managing a company? You know, so um, Pittsburgh really has some great neighborhoods. Uh, there's a number of great restaurants. So, you know, I don't say I'm a foodie, but I, I like to cook. I certainly do. And I like to go out to eat. So I like to try new places, try new restaurants. Uh, and we're, we're very fortunate that we've got a lot of new places that uh, have done well. And this is pre-pandemic, I'll, I'll have to admit, you know, a lot of restaurants were you know, just continuing to open and boom in 2019 and 2020 came and 2021 is here. And things were still a little bit challenging from a restaurant perspective, but, that's such a fun thing for me to do. Um, I you don't like, have you don't have to drive all the way to Philadelphia to get a good cheese steak. Well, yes, you do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there, there are some good places in Pittsburgh that have a cheese steak, but uh, you know, I, I was born and raised in Philadelphia, um, and I can tell you that I, I think I probably know the vast majority of cheesesteak places in Philly, and I certainly have an order priority, <laughs> which I think are good. Uh, and, and I know that uh, cheesesteaks in Philly are pretty darn good, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so that brings us to our rapid fire section of, of this interview. So we just uh, throw some quick questions out there and tell us the first thing that comes to mind. So talking foodie, what is the, your favorite food that might surprise us? Uh, uh, veal parm. Veal parm or veal salt and vodka. I, I love Italian food. Uh, well, mamma mia. Bad. Yeah, that's right. I grew up in an Italian family. My mom was a fantastic cook. My grandfather was an Italian immigrant. So, um, you know, Italian food, particularly veal parm and veal salt and vodka. Yeah. No, no question. Well, we're all going to have to get together with Jamie in, uh, in uh, Federal Hill in, in Providence. And exactly. Have exactly. some good Italian at some point. So. Right. That's right. We uh, know where it's at. Uh, Jamie Scott Okataya. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, okay. If you could watch one movie and this could actually be horrible on repeat for 24 hours straight, <laughs> those eyes, eyeballs up, uh, what would it be? What's your favorite movie? National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Oh, that's, that's a, good one. a shocker. Uh, you know, that is a funny, funny movie. Uh, I can't say that I've ever sat and watched it for 24 hours straight, but during the Christmas season, I will watch that thing five, six, seven times. Uh, I know almost every line to it. I know everything that's coming, but it still makes me laugh. And I think it's just a riot. And, uh, you know, when I'm watching a movie, I'd rather laugh than cry. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm interested in. Here, here. And anything that gets me in the Christmas spirit, I'm all about too. I'm like here Christmas in July around here. Um, so if you could try out any job for just one day, what would you choose? I would be a framing carpenter. Um, you know, I just love building. Uh, you know, I, I sort of tinker a little bit with woodworking and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, maybe it's the engineering background. But to be part of a crew that just builds homes and, you know, just to see the way those things get thrown up anymore, you know, two, three days, and you have a house framed. 
that looks like a lot of fun. And as I said, I, I've sort of tinkered a lot with my own personal projects, but I would love to be a framing carpenter. I think it would be just a blast to do that. Yeah, well, they're, they're in great demand. And uh, uh, well, thanks for joining us, Jim. It's been really great learning about your vision and uh, the way you're helping customers. And we can't wait to come down one day and, and see a Steelers game. So we'll, uh, we'll keep that on the back burner, but uh, really great hearing about your vision and team. Yeah. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure being with you all today. I enjoyed our conversation and uh, look forward to having you come to Pittsburgh, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Steelers game. That's a thing. <laughs> all right. That sounds great. And guys, if you enjoyed listening to today's Data Movers podcast as much as we did, be sure to check out jsa.net slash podcasts for more upcoming Data Movers episodes. We release those every other week on Wednesdays. So uh, please join us there. And follow us on Twitter at Jay Scotto and Evan Kerstell, where we love to engage. So until then. As always, family, stay safe and happy networking. <laughs>